Well, Friday, our good friend and a Christian patriot, Chief Justice Roy Moore, was suspended from office of the Alabama Supreme Court. And uh, he is a good friend for us individually and for our congregation. He's spoken from this pulpit uh, two times in the past decade. And we can only characterize what took place in Alabama as he was put on trial as a kangaroo court, although as someone said, that would be to insult kangaroos in, in this case. They deserve better than that. Uh, of the six judicial charges against him that he somehow violated ethics judicially, uh, one I found particularly puzzling because it is this one. Let me read it to you. Canon 2B, it said that in that he failed to avoid conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice that brings the judicial office into disrepute. So in other words, his action of defending God's holy institution of marriage brought the judicial branch of government into disrepute? Wow, what an astonishing statement. Just, just think of that for a moment. What have the courts in America done? They have claimed to overthrow Almighty God, to throw Him off His throne in heaven, and then they have acted to trample His holy institution of marriage into the dust, and then they have... Uh, attacked family government in this same action, in addition to overturning 6,000 years of human history and human tradition, not to mention that they have also exalted the most wicked of abominations, and they're worried about, they're worried about their reputation? They're worried about the courts being brought into disrepute? Wow, what an amazing thing has taken place. You see, the actions of Chief Justice Roy Moore to stand on behalf of God's holy institution of marriage gives the judicial office the respect it should have and the opposite of what the rest of the courts in America are doing. In fact, if we look across the land, there's only been one state judicial system that has stood against the wicked abomination of what I can only call sodomite unmarriage. Only one state only one judiciary, and that was the Supreme Court of Alabama, of which Chief Justice Roy Moore has been now suspended. In a statement following that suspension, Justice Roy Moore said, this decision clearly reflects the corrupt nature of our political and legal system at the highest levels. After the Attorney General of Alabama declined to prosecute this case, in other words, the Attorney General looked at the same evidence that this court looked at and said, no, there's nothing here to prosecute. After the Attorney General refused to prosecute this case, the Judicial Inquiry Commission employed the former legal director of the Southern Poverty Law Center, a communist organization, which filed the charges against me at the cost of up to $75,000 to the taxpayers of Alabama. During the trial, he continues, which lasted approximately four hours, the Judicial Inquiry Commission produced no witnesses, no affidavits, and no evidence to meet their burden of proof uh, of clear and convincing evidence that the administration order of January 6, 2016 violated the canons of judicial ethics. He continues, this was a politically motivated effort by radical homosexuals and transgender groups to remove me as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court because of outspoken opposition to their immoral agenda. This opinion, he continues, violates not only the legal standards of evidence, but also the rule of law, which states that no judge can be removed from office except by unanimous vote, end quote. In other words, it is plain and simple, a persecution of a Christian who stood on the principles of God's word and acted in office based upon what is lawful and right. And so because Judge Roy Moore, Chief Justice Roy Moore, acted upon the true rule of law, upholding his oath to the United States Constitution and his oath to the Alabama Constitution, he was suspended from office by a unanimous vote of the nine uh, members of the court of the judiciary. What the court failed to uphold is the rule of law. The Supreme Court in the 
federal Supreme Court did not overturn the marriage laws of the state of Alabama. First of all, because the Creator God is the one who established marriage and God's law is supreme. No one can overturn God's law. No wicked tyrant in a black robe can do that. Secondly, anyone who knows even the very basic civic lessons about civil government structure in America knows that the judiciary branch cannot and does not make law. They never make law. That's the legislative branch. All legislative power resides in a Congress, not in the judges, not in a judiciary. And thirdly, even if the Supreme Court opinion in Oberfeld had any effect on anyone at all, it would not be to, it would be only to those parties who came into court before the Supreme Court and no one else. And Alabama was not one of the states that was party to the case of, called Oberfeld. He had no force, therefore, in the state of Alabama at all. You see, instead, the Constitution of the state of Alabama that declares that marriage is between one man and one woman, that is the law of the land of Alabama. Furthermore, the supreme law of our land is our United States Constitution. And the only powers that we, the people, have granted to the federal government there in Washington, D.C., are those limited, delegated, enumerated powers stated in the Constitution itself. And when you study that document from one end to the other of that document, nowhere have we, the people, in any way, shape, or form, given the federal government any power over the issue of marriage at all. Nowhere. You won't find it because we never granted them any such power. And therefore the Ninth and Tenth Amendment apply, which leaves the whole realm of marriage to the state governments and the federal government can say nothing about marriage at all. It has no power and no authority over marriage whatsoever. No jurisdiction whatsoever. Thus, Oberfeld is nothing short of a fraud. That's right. And what's being claimed that the Supreme Court can make law is a lie. And the supposition that any decision of the Supreme Court applies to all the states is nothing short of tyranny. That's what's happening in America. The reality that so many Americans believe these lies, believe this fraud, and submit to this tyranny reveals a new American idol, and it's not a TV show. This is a serious American idol. Americans bowing down and worshiping a god of their own invention, and the idol that they bow down and worship is the Supreme Court, and the belief that the Supreme Court is God. And therefore, if the Supreme Court says that marriage is whatever they say it is, that's what it is, because the Supreme Court is the ultimate ruler of the universe. And it appears there's a lot of Americans that bow down and worship and genuflect before this idol of the Supreme Court, such as the media. You'll hear all the media in America say, well, the Supreme Court made it the law in America that two men can marry in every state. No, they didn't. But the media genuflect and bow before this false idol. And nearly all office holders in America throughout the land also bow down and worship this golden calf of the Supreme Court of the United States. And it's become apparent in Chief Justice Roy Moore's case, as I think it will be in other office holders' case, that any office holder that will not bow down and worship the golden calf of the Supreme Court of these United States is going to be ejected and run out of office. That's what it's about. That's what's happening. And this is what I'm calling judicial ideology. You might look at that word and say, that's not a word. In fact, the spell checker says that's not a word, but it is a word. I looked it up in the 20 volume Oxford English Dictionary where ideology is defined as self worship. That is, worshiping oneself is ideology. And that's what the judges in America are doing today. They're worshiping themselves, judicial ideology, and they're demanding that Americans bow down and worship them just as the Israelites were worshiping the golden calves. What should we think about somebody that worships themselves? 
that thinks they are God, that thinks they are the supreme rulers of the universe. Well, the kindest thing we could think about such a person that does that is that they are at least delusional. You know, they really need some help to overcome their delusions. They need a dose of reality. But one thing is quite clear. Such a delusional person should never be allowed anywhere near the levers of power in our society. They're dangerous to themselves, being that delusional, and they're dangerous to everyone else as well. Instead, today in America, nearly every position of power is in the hands of the delusional. Indeed, the lunatics are now running this country. Now, one of the great ironies of that decision on Friday of the court of judiciary is that the leader of that court of the judiciary is one chief judge, J. Michael Joyner. And because it was a unanimous vote to suspend Chief Justice Roy Moore, that tells us that Michael J. Joyner voted to suspend Chief Justice Roy Moore, who is Chief Judge J. Michael Joyner. He's an active member of the Church of Brook Hills of Birmingham, Alabama, one of the mega churches in that city. There in that church, he teaches a Sunday morning Bible study that you go to the website and it invites you to come to his Bible study that he teaches at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings. He previously served as a deacon of this Church of Brook Hills, as well as he serves as the chairman or has served as the chairman of the Shelby Baptist Association credentials committee. What does that mean? It means that he was involved in determining the orthodoxy of the pastors in the Southern Baptist movement in that part of Alabama, evaluating pastors as to whether they were orthodox and they believed what the Word of God said, or if they were not orthodox, if they were heterodox or, or her heretical, to reject them and say, you cannot be a pastor in the Southern Baptist church, at least in that uh, section of Alabama. So it made me a little curious, what does this church he was a deacon of and, a, and is now a leader in, and so on, what does this church believe about the Bible, what God's Word said? So I checked their website, and they said, and this is a very orthodox statement, by the way, it said the Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of himself to man. Well, that's good. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. Really? Divine instruction regarding marriage as well? Hmm, I don't know. And then it goes on. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us. Wow. And therefore is and will remain to the end of the world. The the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. Wow, very good. In other words, we're to judge human standards, human opinions, and so forth by what? By the Bible. It's the final standard. And then it concludes all Scripture is a testimony to Christ who is himself the focus of divine revelation. Amen to all of that. This is true. This is orthodox. This is a correct belief about the Bible. But what's going on then with a man who says he believes this was a, is still a leader in the church that says they believe that and yet voted to suspend Chief Justice Roy Moore from office because Chief Justice Roy Moore stood for God's holy institution of marriage as between one man and one woman. The question I have is will that church at Brook Hills <clears throat> discipline this leader in their church? Well, I wouldn't hold my breath and probably none of us should hold our breath uh, for that. Chief Justice Roy Moore rightly stated after the trial, if we sit back and let the federal courts intrude their powers into state sovereignty, then we are neglecting everything about which the Constitution stands. Amen to that. It makes the real point here is the tyranny of Washington, D.C. against the states. Forcing the states to accept sodomite unmarriage is what this is about. Washington, D.C. has become a wicked tyrant. 
and it itself is living outside and acting outside the supreme law of the land, our U.S. Constitution. Supreme Court doesn't make law. It can never make law. All legislative authority is in the hands of Congress, not the Supreme Court. And thus, Judge Roy Moore was appealing only to the law, the supreme law of the land. The supreme law of Alabama acknowledges God in the Constitution and the laws of the state of Alabama. The real issue is that communists and liberals ignoring true law are usurping all authority, authority that has not, uh, is not theirs, and they're imposing new definitions upon marriage and upon the people of Alabama in order to destroy God's holy institution of marriage and to destroy family government. What's happening in America in the big picture is this. There is a gross abomination taking place and a wholesale redefinition of sin. This clearly in God's word is sin that the government is now saying, no, it's not. It is not sin at all. In fact, it's equivalent to God's holy institution of marriage. And many Americans sadly believe that our land can somehow get away with gross immorality and with this gross idolatry of worshiping the Supreme Court as God, that we can somehow get away with this and we can escape God's righteous judgment. If you have your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. You recall that Israel was engaged in some parallel behaviors here to what's taking place in America. A parallel set of sins, the window dressing might be different, but essentially they're the same sins of idolatry and immorality. Idolatry and immorality linked together. And this was a very dangerous and deadly situation. Notice what Moses says. This is Exodus 32, uh, beginning at verse 30. Exodus 32, 30. And it came to pass on the morrow, by the way, that morrow is what we looked at, uh, the, the, the day before is what we looked at last week, when God ordained the Levites to go in the midst of the people and to execute all those idolaters and those committing immorality, and 3,000 were executed that day. So this is the next day after the dead had been buried, came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them a god of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Moses tried to remind the people of the grave nature of the sin that they had committed against God. There were, this is no minor infraction of something. This was a flagrant rebellion against God, a flagrant violation of God's clear law. Think about our own nation in parallel to this at this point in time. What is our country doing? It is a far worse rebellion against God to redefine God's holy institution of marriage than to do the wicked sins that Israel was doing in its day. It is far worse to overthrow that which is righteous and instead put that which is an abomination in place of that which is righteous. And that's what's being done here in America today. And so if Israel committed a great sin, America has committed a greater sin and stands under the wrath of God. Notice the fact that Moses states here, atonement must be made for every single sin. No sin ever committed by anyone everywhere can go unpunished because God is just. God is holy, and He is righteous, and He presides over and created a universe that is just, that is righteous, and that is holy, and that cannot allow a sin to go unpunished. Not one sin will go unpunished. Well, what are the options for the penalty of that sin? There's only two options, really, very limited, just two. One is eternal death. Eternal death in hell for the wages of sin is 
death, and no amount of ink spilled by a legislature or a court system can change that law of the universe. The wages of sin is death. And so that's only option one. Option two, the only other option, is a perfect substitutionary atonement be made to stand in our place as the sinners who are worthy of eternal death in hell. Those are the only two. Well, let's consider that first option, eternity in hell. And let's consider it for a moment because in reality, in America, this option has been thrown out by many people as, oh, that's a fairy tale. That's not true. In fact, you'll hear hell referred to in locker rooms and golf courses and boardrooms and all over our country more than you'll ever hear the word hell coming from the pulpits of America. The word hell has been banished from most pulpits in America in our land. Pastor John MacArthur notes, because of years of indifference to the doctrine of hell in the pulpits, he said, after years of indifference, finally, it was paved the way for open hostility. In the first decade of the new millennium, certain prominent figures in what's called the emergent church declared war on the biblical doctrine of hell. The groundswell seemed to crest a couple of years ago with the publication of Rob Bell's best-selling book, Love Wins. Bell argued that it's absurd to think of a loving God, uh, think a loving God would ever damn anyone to eternal punishment. He portrayed God's love as a force that clashes with and ultimately eliminates the demands of justice. In the storyline, Bell envisions he envisions God requires no payment or punishment for sin. The divine response to evil is always remedial, never uh, punitive. Furthermore, the wages of sin are mild, temporary, just reserved for only the grossest malevolent villains, mass murderers and child rapists and tyrants who engender genocide and, and this is John MacArthur's edition, Christians who tell unbelievers they should fear God. When it's all over, according to Bell, everyone will be together in paradise. In such a system, God's righteousness is compromised, repentance is optional, optional, atonement is unnecessary, and the truth of God's word is nullified. In other words, nothing of biblical Christianity is left. Once anyone sets out to tone down or to tame uh, the hard truths of Scripture, MacArthur says, that's where the process inevitably leads, end quote. So God's Word says something, and people in the pulpits of most American churches today completely reject what God's Word clearly states. For example, if you have your finger there, turn to Psalm, uh, Psalm 9 and verse 7. Here's a, a psalm that America needs to hear loud and clear. Psalm chapter 9, and specifically uh, verse 17, excuse me, Psalm 917. The wicked, it says, Psalm says in Psalm 19, 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Wow. Has America forgotten God? It's turned to worship idols instead of worshiping the one true God. The nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. So the question we ought to be asking, is America going to be turned into hell? As the psalmist in Psalm 917 says, I would have to say yes, unless there is true repentance in our land and a true return to worshiping the one true God. Now let's go back to uh, Exodus 32, because Moses did an astonishing thing here before the Lord. He offered himself as an atonement for the sins of the people of Israel. He said, you know, blot me out of your book. And we recall, because we've looked at that before in Revelation chapter 20, the books are opened at the great white throne judgment, the book that is a record of every person's life, everything they ever did, everything they ever said, everything they ever thought is recorded in God's book and they're going to be judged according to what's recorded in the book. And then another book is opened, the book of life. And those whose names are found written in the book of life, they're the ones that go to heaven. And anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire, which Revelation 20 describes as the second death. It's one thing to die physically. That's the first death. The second death is to die spiritually, to be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. And Moses is saying here in, in Exodus 32, Lord, blot me out of your book. 
That is, for the sins of the people so that those sins can be forgiven. Make me the substitutionary atonement. Throw me into the lake of fire for all eternity so that Israel might be saved. Wow. I know that I'm I'm prepared to make that kind of prayer to God. Cast me into hell so that somebody else be saved. But Moses, the great saint, had that heart and that love for those people. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, What a saint uh, uh, Moses was. But you know what? God could not and did not accept Moses' offer of himself as the substitutionary atonement. You see, a sinner, which Moses was a sinner, he sinned perhaps less than most of us, but he did sin. As a sinner, he could not pay the penalty for another person's sin because his own sin had to be paid for first. After all, a sinner can never fully pay for any of his own sins at all. Which, by the way, is why hell is eternal. You see, after a billion years, the person who is suffering in hell has not paid for his sins. After two billion years and a hundred billion years and a billion billion years, they still have not paid for their sins. Our problem is we don't see sin as the serious deadly thing that it actually is that the word of God says the wages of sin is death that is eternal damnation and hell that's the wages of sin and the sinner who has sinned can never pay for the full penalty of their sin which understanding that leaves us in a very very serious dilemma how can we ever have our sins paid for if another sinner cannot possibly pay for them. And so God in His great mercy gave us the answer to that. Turn to Hebrews in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 7. Look at verses 4 through 7 of Hebrews chapter 10. A perfect sacrifice was found, and it's in Jesus Christ. Verse 4 of Hebrews 10. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. In other words, all the Old Testament sacrificial system that was established here at Mount Sinai, all of it was only a temporary covering. It could not permanently pay for anyone's sin whatsoever. Not possible. Then verse 5, Wherefore, when he, referring to Jesus Christ, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, that is, God the Father wouldn't accept, but a body hast thou prepared me, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. All the animal sacrifices could never permanently pay for sin. After all, you have an animal dying for a human being. That's not an equivalent. You need to have a perfect human being who never sinned, and not just a perfect human being fully man, but a perfect human being also fully God. Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, living a perfect, sinless life, He alone could be our substitute, taking our place by His death on the cross, paying the full penalty for our sins in total. You see, only the blood of a sinless being, fully God and fully man, can take away the full penalty of sin. And Jesus Christ did that by His death on the cross. Therefore, outside of Jesus Christ, there is no hope of salvation. There is no other that can save anyone at all. There is no Buddha. There is no uh, Shinto religion or Confucian. There is no other false religion that offers any hope of salvation. They don't have an answer to the problem of human sin and atonement for human sin. Only Jesus Christ does. And Jesus stated that. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the only path of salvation. He is the only one who could pay the penalty for our sins. Now let's go back and see what God says next to to Moses in Exodus 32. Exodus 32 verse 34 is a recommissioning of Moses to his mission of, of taking the children of Israel and leaving the Mount Sinai. Look at what it says. Exodus 32 and verse 34. Therefore go now, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. 
And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf, which Aaron made. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swore unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it, and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. And no man did put on him his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. You see, God in His mercy does not completely obliterate the children of Israel there at the foot of Mount Sinai as He could have justly and rightly done. In His mercy, as He states here, He didn't even come into the midst of them because a holy God in the midst of a sinful people would completely consume them. They would be destroyed in a moment. Instead, God in His mercy had told them to continue on to the promised land that He'd promised to their forefathers. And God even promises a special provision of His angel that will go with them and protect them. And the angel will go ahead of them and drive out the wicked people in the land, the land of promise that they are going to inherit. In other words, as wicked as Israel is, there are some other nations that are more wicked than Israel is. And this angel was sent by God to drive out those people. Now, there are many people who say they're Christians that have problems with this. They read about God destroying the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Hivites and all the, and they say, oh, that's not really good for God to just destroy these whole nations, men, women, and children, and even the animals. Why did God do that? We need to read all that Scripture says about those nations that have discovered they were wicked nations to the core. Very great wickedness was committed by them. Not only gross idolatry, but also gross immorality. Not only were they sons of Sodom in their wickedness, but they engaged in bestiality as well, which is why I believe that all the animals in those nations were destroyed at God's command because every person, including children, were corrupted and the animals as well were defiled and had to be destroyed. These nations also engaged in child sacrifice, offering their children in the most brutal, wicked tortures as they tortured them to death. And uh, some of them were engaged in cannibalism. And look at these wicked sins, and God saw the wicked sins of these nations. And as they practiced them, God gave them time to repent. Abraham, 400 years earlier, God said, for 400 years, the wickedness of these nations has not reached the full cup. And I'm going to give them 400 years, which they have an opportunity in 400 years to repent of their sins. And they did not repent of their wicked evils. They continued in those wicked evils. And so the time of waiting for their repentance was up. And their destruction, their day of judgment was now upon those nations. And God was going to use Israel to execute that judgment and destroy those nations. And those nations, by the way, were ultimately totally destroyed. They are erased Yes, we have them historically here in the Bible, but they no longer exist as a people group on the face of planet Earth. We ought to learn a lesson from this sobering account. Nations are judged by God in this world, in history. Unlike individuals that can be judged by God both in this world and judged in the next world, nations can only be judged by God in this world. And God does judge every single nation in this world, in this time, here and now. And so a nation would be a ship of fools to think that if in the long run they somehow can get away with the evil they do as a nation, that somehow they can escape the wrath of God, a nation would be a fool to believe any such thing. And the judges in Alabama are fools if they think the state of Alabama will somehow escape the judgment of God, or fools that they think they themselves will escape personally 
God's wrath and God's judgment upon them. They're believing a lie if they think they will escape. You recall that someone once said, if you tell a lie, tell a big lie enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. Many of us have heard that quote, but the rest of it is very telling because that person went on to say, the lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent. For the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Do you recall who said that? Joseph Goebbels, the infamous Nazi propagandist. And I think he had it right. I find it fascinating that he say, it says, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state that is a state that is committed to lying and, and perpetuating those lies. And I think that explains a great deal of what's happening in America today. Why the wicked are permitted to remain in power today? It's because people don't want to recognize the truth that God will judge sin. The truth that the wages of sin is death. Instead, they want to believe that somehow people ultimately will not wind up in hell if they don't repent and turn to faith in Jesus Christ. They don't want, want to repent of their own sins, and so they don't want leaders who would remind them and recognize that America as a nation must repent of its sins in order to be spared the judgment of God. And so they wouldn't mind a president who in his own words said he never did anything. He would have to ask God for forgiveness. No recognition of sin. No awareness of the terrible penalty for sin. Therefore, no need to repent of anything at all. The people of Israel, whether they believed in sin or not, they were judged by God. A plague came upon them, and many more died than the 3,000 that were executed the day before by the Levites. Judgment still fell on people in spite of the fact they didn't believe in the consequences of sin. And you see, that's true today as well. Look at verse 33 here in, in uh, Exodus uh, 32. Some were actually blotted out of God's book. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Remember that book? The book of life that if your name is not found in the book of life, then you're cast into the lake of fire for all eternity? A permanent removal, a blotting out of your name from the book of life should be the most feared thing for every human being that is aware of the sobering reality of sin and eternity in hell. The reason many people today have their head in the sand about sin and about hell is the truth that Ecclesiastes states. Let me read to you from Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You see, the foolish believe because they're not executed immediately by God that His wrath doesn't immediately fall upon them that somehow they're going to get away and God will never judge them. They will escape God's wrath. I like Longfellow's little poem that says, Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceedingly small. Though with patience he stands waiting, with exactness grinds he all. God's judgment is certain. No one can escape it. The people of Israel begin to wake up to this as, as Moses confronted them. And the people began to mourn. And they remove their ornaments, the symbols of joy and rejoicing and, and of happiness. They remove those, those symbols. Their ornaments are set aside, and not just for a day, but the in indication is here as they left Mount Sinai and they began to travel, they put their ornaments away. They were in a state of mourning because of their great sin and the consequence of their sin as they left Mount Sinai. The challenge for everyone is this, that true repentance will have an outward manifestation. A person will not go on the way they have continued in their life to that point. The sadness in the morning, 
they entered into was because they repented. True repentance will have a profound effect upon a person's life in every area of their life. And sometimes it takes a confrontation with death to bring about that repentance. I think of a believer, I'm going to read his story in a moment, who confronted death. And consider the way this person confronted death with another person in the same circumstances who had no assurance of their salvation, who was about to face an eternity without Christ. When Dr. Andrew Jameson boarded U.S. Airways Flight 1549 on that very cold day in January 2009, he had no idea, as did none of the other passengers, that they would come face to face with death in a few short moments. He tells it this way, the takeoff seemed to be going normally when about a minute into it, there was a loud thud and the plane shook. My first thought was that, well, that's just a little turbulence. But just to make sure, I glanced down from my book and I glanced at the flight attendant because that had always been my gauge as to whether or not I should be worried. She was visibly concerned. I was in the very back of the plane but somebody a little further forward could see the engine spark and start to smoke. And so that got my attention. I put my book down. I could smell the smoke coming in at that time. And I thought, well, that's just the right engine because he was on the right side of the plane. With my limited knowledge of aircraft, I knew that we only needed one engine to fly. And so I told the lady next to sitting beside me, we can get all the way to Charlotte on one engine if we have to. Then it was quiet too quiet, and I realized that both engines were out. In reality, it all happened very fast, and within 30 seconds, I knew we were going down. The flight attendant was digging around the seat behind me looking for a transponder or something, so it was very clear that whatever was happening was not normal. And at that moment, it hit everybody and stunned us that we were going down. I tried to call my wife, Jeanette, Jennifer, excuse me, to say goodbye, but my cell phone wouldn't work. Then I turned to the lady beside me, and maybe uh, working in a uh, context where you have to always ask permission to pray with somebody, I asked her if it was okay if I said a prayer. And she looked at me if, as if I was crazy and said, of course. And so the lady and I and the guy who was sitting beside us who leaned in bowed our heads, and I don't remember what I said word for word. But since I was reading the sovereignty of God, it was something like this. God, we know you are sovereign and that you are in control of planes, even planes without engines. We pray that your will be done. And I ask for a peace that surpasses all understanding to descend upon all of us. And God, I pray that if there's anyone listening who does not know, that you would make them clear make it clear to them right now what your son has done for us on the cross. There wasn't much panic. Some pra passengers were praying Hail Marys. You could hear some sobbing and some crying, but no screaming, no carrying on like you might expect. About the time we finished that prayer, the captain came over the speaker and said, brace for impact. What happened next was, to me, the greatest miracle that occurred that day. I experienced a peace that I can't fully explain. I fully expected to die in a few seconds, and yet it was okay. I was enveloped in a remarkable comfort and peace even as we braced for impact. Then we hit the water. And I'm often asked what it was like when we hit, and honestly, I can't give a great answer. At the time, I was expecting to get ripped to pieces so anything short of that was pretty outstanding. What I remember most about the landing was the almost immediate rush of extremely cold water I felt at my feet. It started at my ankles, and by the time the plane came to rest, there was water up to my knees. So all of a sudden, a new fear crept into my mind. I'm going to drown. I can't get off the plane. Can't see the exits. However, when I stood up, I could see the nearest exit was behind me at the back of the plane, where somebody was struggling in chest-high water now to get it open, and they couldn't. With the rate of water rushing, rising, it seemed uh, clear that we wouldn't have much time. But suddenly the water stopped rising, and the people ahead of me were able to open the other exit, so everyone was able to get off in orderly fashion. 
I was one of the last ones off through the left front door. And when I got into that raft, with a great sense of relief and praise, I asked if I could pray another prayer. This was a prayer of thanksgiving. Then the captain and co-captain got into the same raft, and they were talking about the very small number of prior successful ditchings. And as they talked, it really hit me. This truly was an extraordinary event. God gave this Christian man perfect peace in the face of death. Why? This man knew that he was a sinner, deserving of eternal death in hell. He knew that Jesus is the one who was his perfect substitutionary atonement, who took his place on the cross, paying the full price for his sins by his death. He knew that Jesus paid it all. And he knew, as I shared with the children this morning, that he had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He had received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And therefore, in the face of death, he knew that he was going to be in God's presence in heaven for all eternity. And he expected to die, yet he had perfect peace. I can imagine around him, others were in great turmoil, knowing that as they faced death, likewise they were sinners, that they deserved eternal hell, but there was no substitute that paid for them, that they were without hope in the face of eternal future in hell. My friends, it's not just our country that needs to repent. Americans individually need to come to faith in Jesus Christ, repent of their sins, receive the gift of salvation, receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior so that they, even if our nation is destroyed by God, even if it, it is ultimately disaster, they personally, individual, can enter into eternity to be in God's presence.